Ninguém. today. Uh, if you're welcome, if you are new to us today, uh, we're looking forward to be able to worship with you. I'm going to give God thanks for you being able to be here. Uh, if you have an uh, opportunity today to tear off that little insert in your bulletin, it um, will help us know how we can pray with you since we're having communion today. Um, at the end of our service, we won't have a chance to pray with you out loud, but it's been great to be with you, and I think we got a scripture reading to start. From Philippians 3, Paul says, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. 
I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Amen? Listen again to the verses 8 through 11. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Lord, thank you that you have made a way for us. And it's not dependent on the things that we do, but rather it's dependent on your finished work on the cross. And that we live now with the resurrection power in us because of our faith in you. We thank you for this great gift. Amen.
looking forward to that, being able to sing with the angels around the throne, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty.
Please be seated. Oh, sorry. Again, it's good to be with you. If the kids ages four to eight would like to come on down. 
for our children's time. Let's see what movie we got today. All right. story you guys are going to hear about today. <laughs> you have to tell us what you learn, okay? I think Miss Shannon is going to help us today, so why don't you guys go on back. Please stand as you're able and turn to number 132 in your hymnals. Join all the glorious names. I got my glass of water. I got the frog in my throat here. So. <clears throat> well, again, it's good to have you with us today, especially as we continue in our journey through, through the story. And as I thought about today's, and as you saw in the graphic that we had for the kids today, it's an interesting time that we live in. As I thought about it, maybe this is a timely message for us. Maybe it's always a timely message, though, where often there's political unrest, and we know the division that oftentimes can result from such things. And we know as God's people, we are called to trust in the Lord, who we're told will use the leaders to accomplish His will. And I think that's especially true for us when we find there's political leaders that we're not so sure about. As I thought about the last few years, if President Obama caused a rift in our nation, Certainly, President Trump is causing new divisions to an extreme in our country. And we may wonder, with that observation, if our nation can stand. And I think the answer is yes. 
Yes, it is possible. But if we follow the pattern that we see here in the book of Kings, we run the risk of having even greater division. As we saw in 1 Kings last time, it, it oftentimes, to have wisdom, we know that humility is needed from both the people and its leaders. In the story so far, we've seen how God has used Israel to reveal his character to the world so that they may desire to know him and do life with him. And when Israel has looked after God, like we saw in the Judges, there were great things to draw people to see, get a glimpse of what it's like to be in God's family. But of course, just as we saw in Judges as well, when the people turned their backs on God, when they lived selfishly, he disciplined to draw them back to himself. You see, the Lord longs to have relationship with us. He longed to have it with his people. He longs to continue that to us today. And last week we looked to Solomon, and there with Solomon we saw that the Lord answered his prayers, that Solomon had all wisdom, wealth, and even a long life. But, and that's the big but that we saw here, but because of his disobedience, that blessing would be removed. We saw that in 1 Kings 11, verses 4 and 6, where we read this, When Solomon was old, his wife seduced him to follow other gods. He was not completely devoted to Yahweh, his God, as his father David had been. Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight, and unlike his father David, he did not completely follow Yahweh. Let's pray. Lord, I pray this morning that we not only see the consequences of Solomon's failure, but as we look to the consequences in the nation of Israel, may we see how we can stand strong, how we can avoid the traps that we find with Rehoboam and Jeroboam. May we stand strong with you, Lord. Amen. Well, again, as we see in 1 Kings 11, there are consequences. And that consequences is what we find in verses 9 through 13 again in, in 1 Kings 11. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude, and you have not kept my covenants and my decrees which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but I will give him one tribe for the sake of David my servant and for the sake of Jerusalem which I have chosen. You see, the kingdom was to be divided. As we go on in the story, we find part of it would be given to his son, Rehoboam, and the other part to his servant, Jeroboam. I want us today to consider the reasons behind the division, how they got to this place, and to learn from that how division can be avoided for us. You see, we read in the story that this division could have been avoided. It could have been avoided. Now, the Lord knew that they would go on this path, but had they made other choices, it would seem that it could have been avoided if they would have looked to the Lord. The story begins in 1 Kings 11 and 28, where Jer Jeroboam is appointed by Solomon to be a leader. This is what it says. It says, Jeroboam was a very capable young man, and when Solomon saw how industrious he was, he put him in charge of the labor force in the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh and the descendants of Joseph. Now, to 29, the next verse, we see that something else is going on that, that nobody was expecting. It was a word from the Lord. The Lord speaks through this prophet. Listen to what the prophet says. It says, one day as Jeroboam was leaving Jerusalem, the prophet Ajah from Shiloh met him along the way. And Ajah was wearing a new cloak. 
The two of them were alone in the field, and Ajah took the new cloak he was wearing and tore it into twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take ten of these pieces, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I'm about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon, and I will give ten of the tribes to you. But I will leave one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. He repeats the same words that we saw the Lord speak to Solomon. Now it's interesting. Solomon learns of this prophecy. And although the very words have been told to him, Solomon seeks to preempt the Lord's judgment. And he seeks to kill Jeroboam. Now when he learns of this plot that to kill him, he flees to Egypt. And we'll get back to that in a little bit. We fast forward to the end of the chapter and we see that Solomon dies after serving as Israel's king for 40 years. In 1 Kings 11.43, we see that Rehoboam, his son, succeeded him as king. Now, now we fast forward. We know that Jeroboam is in Egypt. He's learned of Solomon's death. And he knows a prophecy that was spoken over him. The question is, what, what would you do if you were in his shoes? It may surprise us to see what, what he chooses to do. He chooses to return to Jerusalem, not to claim what was spoken over him, but we find that he returns to seek peace for the nation of Israel. Chapter 12, verses 3 and 4. The leaders of Israel summoned him, and Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel went to speak with Rehoboam. Your father was a hard master, they said. Lighten the harsh labor demands and the heavy taxes that your father imposed on us then we will be your loyal subjects. King, treat us fairly. Treat us fairly. And we will be your loyal subjects. Rehoboam tells him to come back in three days. And he had give him, give them his answer. Now you see, at this point, there's no conflict really. The king has died. Rehoboam is now the king over the whole nation of Israel. The twelve tribes that were brought together under David have been rejoined, stand together. No conflict. The proverbial ball is in Rehoboam's court. This is what we request. Treat us fairly, lessen the taxes, and we'll be your loyal subjects. That's what's going to happen if he agrees. But what's going to happen if he doesn't agree? Well, I suppose there's this unspoken statement. Rehoboam certainly also knows of the prophecy. And he also knows that should he not agree, that it's likely the nation will be divided. So, we find that Rehoboam is wise and seeks out counsel. He first goes to the advisors, the elders that had advised his father Solomon. In verses 6 and 7 we read this. When King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon when he was alive, asking, How do you advise me to respond to these people? And they replied, Today, if you will be a servant to these people and serve them, and if you respond to them, speaking kind words to them, then they will be your servants forever. The council was simple. Serve the people, and they will serve you. The leaders, I think, these elders have reiterated what the Lord had spoken to Solomon. If you remember, Solomon has gone before the Lord seeking what? Seeking wisdom to rule his people. However, as we know, as the story goes on, as we just looked at the very end of Solomon's life in his old age, he began to see the people to be his servants, and he ended up wearing them down, overtaxing them to do all these building projects that Solomon had. And the people had had enough. The Lord had showed Solomon that wisdom began with humility. And just as Solomon, at the end of his life, has rejected the Lord's wisdom, we see that Rehoboam does as well. Verse 8. 
but he rejected the vice, advice of the elders who had advised him and consulted with younger men who had grown up with him and served him. He rejected the wisdom of the elders and surrounded himself with his buddies, his friends, his guys he had grown up with. Why? Now, the text doesn't go out in great detail to tell us, but I think we can understand why he does this. There's a few reasons, and again, we'll look at those more in a minute, but but in part, he surrounds himself with those who will tell him what he wants to hear. He seeks advice to justify what he already wants. Because remember in verse 8, he's already rejected the counsel of these men and then seeks out the counsel of his friends. Verses 9 and 11. What is your advice? He asks them. How should I answer these people who want me to lighten their burdens imposed on by my father? And the young men replied, This is what you shall tell those complainers who want a lighter burden. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Yes, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. Well, on the third day, Jeroboam and the leaders in Israel come back, and this is what they're told, verses 13 and 14. But Rehoboam spoke harshly to the people, for he rejected the advice of the older counselors and followed the counsel of his younger advisors, he told the people, My father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips. I will beat you with scorpions. Well, it's no surprise that the people are dis disappointed. And we're told in verses 15 and 16, So the king paid no attention to the people. This turn of events was the will of the Lord, for it was fulfilled the Lord's message to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, through the prophet Isaiah from Shiloh. When all Israel realized that the king had refused to listen to them, they responded, Down with the dynasty of David! We have no interest in the son of Jesse. Back to your homes, O Israel. Look out for your own house, O David. So the people of Israel returned home. What had been joined together under David was now divided. I don't know if you can feel the pain of these words. So the king paid no attention to the people, and the people turned away. Again, there's nothing new with this, is there? For history is full of these tyrannical leaders who cause revolts among the people. In the case here of God's people, the power struggle divided the nation. And the sad truth is, it would never be brought back together again. It didn't have to divide. We're, we're told in this story when, when they come to the king with this proposal, they promise to follow him, to be his servants. But he won't have anything to do with that. As we think about it, though, there were four if-onlys that I thought about as I read through. If only they would have done this. If only they would have done that. And I want to bring those to your attention so that we can consider them as well as we consider the reasons that we have at times to divide, to separate. Maybe there's things that we can learn that Jeroboam and Rehoboam did not listen to. The first thing is that division could have been avoided if only I would have listened to, in this case, it was those elder counselors. Rehoboam should have been more careful to whom he listened to. So we might say, well, why did he listen to his friends? Why did he listen to them? Well, in all honesty, I think it's the same reason that you listen to those who give you the counsel that you want to hear. You see, they tell us what we want to hear. And we surround ourselves with those that tell us what we want to hear, not necessarily what we need to hear. Rehoboam rejected the counsel of the 
older counselors before he even gets the counsel of the younger men. I think it's similar to what we find the warnings in 2 Timothy 4. For a time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, what will they do? They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to me. I think what we see going on here with, with our story is Rehoboam wants something that these older counselors aren't giving him. He wants something new, if you will. Although it was old because it was the same as Solomon, but, but he wanted something different. You see, these younger men spoke the language that he knew and understood. They spoke the language of self-importance. Your job isn't to serve the people. Their job is to serve you. Contrary to the wisdom that the Lord originally gave to Solomon, but how Solomon's life ended. And in church today, I think we struggle with similar type things. We see this battle going on at times. For some, they they want what is cool over what is wise. They want what is familiar over what is needed. You see, both are extremes and both are errors. One rejects things of the past and the other shuns the things that are new. We're all guilty at times of reasoning something like this. Don't confuse me with the facts. My mind is made up. Rehoboam listened to his friends, and yet we too surround ourselves with those who would tell us what we want to hear. You see, our friends generally, it's not a good thing, but generally our friends are predisposed to tell us what we want to hear. Our friends want to please us. They don't want to tell us something that they believe may put a wedge in our relationship. But listening to people like us, people of our own age, people of our own persuasion, people of our own experiences, people of our own worldviews, it makes it likely that we will continue in the path that we're on. You see, we need advisors that will tell us the truth, not what we want to hear. And if you're wise, you will beg them to give you an honest opinion, not just tickle your ears. Tell us things that made hard for us to hear. Not mean, spirited, but loving. You see, we naturally resist what hurts, but in the end, in the end, we'll be wise because it will save us. We need to know the truth that Solomon spoke in the Proverbs. Solomon said in Proverbs 27, 6, the wounds from a sincere friend The wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Well, the second if only that I thought of is that division could have been avoided if only we owned our own sin. If only we owned our part of the problem. If only, well, we all should know that when we're in an argument, in a relationship, I hate to tell you it isn't always the other person's fault. I know it seems that way, but it's not true. The kingdom was divided because both Jeroboam and Rehoboam were at fault. Now, at first, it may seem that this is all Rehoboam's fault. If only he would have accepted the olive branch that was being offered by Jeroboam and the leaders of Israel, there would have been no problem. Well, that's partly true, but if we back up the clock just a little bit, we see the role that Jeroboam played before that and after that. You see, at first, there's an implication in the text that Jeroboam um, threats in King Solomon from within the power structure. He was appointed by Solomon, sure, but as the nation grew weary of all Solomon's building projects, all the work they were being forced to do, all the taxes that were being collected, they grew weary, and they began to complain, it would seem, to to Jeroboam about all these things. And 
And when Solomon puts him over these northern tribes, it helps establish his position as a spokesperson, as a leader for that section of Israel. And the implication is that when he receives this prophetic word, that rather than waiting for the Lord's time, it seems that he is likely to have taken matters into his own hand, and that is one of the reasons that Solomon sought to kill him and one of the reasons he had to flee to Egypt. He wanted the position, and therefore he shared in the blame of forcing Rehoboam's hand. So after the division, though, things go from bad to worse. As we read on in chapter 12, we find that now, now that they're separated, now that we have the two southern tribes and the ten northern tribes, Jeroboam thinks, you know, it would be best if the people never have to go back to Jerusalem. It's a distraction for them to have to go back there. And you know what makes a lot of sense? Let's establish this worship place. And better yet, let's build or make these two golden calves to represent the idols. Not, not idols, I don't think he would have said. But the places of worship. And he establishes one in Bethel and one in Dan. And Boy, this sounds good, doesn't it? Well, this is how it's laid out in 1 Kings 12. When these people go to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord, they will again give their allegiance to King Rehoboam of Judah. They will kill me and make him their king instead. So, on the advice of his counselors, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, It is too much trouble for you to go and worship in Jerusalem. Look, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of Egypt. As I said, he sets them up in Bethel and Dan. If you go down just a couple verses to verse 30, not surprisingly, we read this. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and the one as far as Dan to worship the other. And this thing became a sin, do you think? I mean, who wouldn't have known that? Even... After, in a couple more verses, we find that the Lord sends a a man of God to to confront him about this, to confront Jeroboam. But we're told that Jeroboam did not change his evil way. You see, when there is conflict in a relationship, when there is conflict, there's a share of the problem that lies with you. Now, It may be, it may be your faulty assumptions. It may be a faulty assumption, you know, Richard meant this when he told me that. Or Bob meant this when he did this to me. Well, maybe, but I'm walking on dangerous ground just simply by assuming that. Assuming I know the meaning of a person's words or actions. I need to be open to my own issues. I need to be open to my own problems to create an environment that will allow for this healing of these wrong feelings. Only then, only after I've owned my part of the problem can the division be overcome. Otherwise, I'm seeking to justify what I've determined in my mind to already do. But God longs for something greater. The third if only that I found here is the division could have been avoided if only we can see how our choices, our decisions affect others. As I said, this this decision for a refusal to yield to one another here affected not only their relationship, but every generation that followed. Every generation that followed. If you read on in 1 Kings, you find a story that rivals the Hatfields and McCoys. If you don't know who they are, ask somebody sitting next to you and they'll tell you the story about them. We won't go into that today. But, but it's that, that conflict, isn't it? We find in verse 30 in chapter 14, there was constant war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And then the generation that follows that in ver- chapter 15, for David's sake, the Lord, his God, allowed his his descendants to continue ruling, shining like a lamp, and he gave um, Abijam, his son, to rule after, after him in Jerusalem. 
For David had done what was pleasing to the, in the Lord's sight and had obeyed the Lord's command throughout his life except in the affair concerning Uriah the Hittite. But, but there was war between Abijan and Jeroboam throughout Abijan's reign. The next generation, the conflict continues. The generation after that, the conflict continues. Chapter 15, verses 14 and 16. Although the pagan shrines were not removed, Asa's heart remained completely faithful to the Lord throughout his life. He brought into the temple of the Lord the silver and gold and the various items that he and his father had dedicated. There was constant war between King Asa of Judah and King Bashasa in of Israel. Judah in the south, Israel in the north. War reigned generation after generation. Starting in 930 B.C., a thousand years till Christ. In a thousand years, we fast forward and we see the aftermath of all this in the Sumerian story. John 4 tells us Jesus' encounter with a Samaritan woman, some of the remnants that's left over from Israel. And the Jews had such a hatred for these things, the Jews of what, Judah? That they would avoid any contact with anybody living in Samaria. The Jews from the south, from Judah's reign, Continued the conflict. Division ruined families for generations, like the Hatfields and the McCoys. Came across, I forgot to write it down, but evidently about uh, 20 years ago or so, there was some reconciliation document written by all the descendants of the Hatfields and McCoys, and the two governors of the states that, that divided them signed off on it. So even there, there can be reconciliation. See, when you decide to destroy a relationship, there's collateral damage. There's collateral damage. It isn't just you, but, but those that you don't even expect are harmed, are endangered by that. The final thing, and maybe this is the most important of them all, but the final thing is that division could have been avoided if only they would have remembered the Lord's words. You see, we have to go back to the root cause of all of this. The root cause really isn't with Jerob Jeroboam and Rehoboam. It's with Solomon. James tells us that it doesn't start with action, but a desire. James 1 tells us this. Temptation comes from, the, from our own desires, which entices us and drags us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So how did it start? How does it start with Solomon? Well, remember, it started little by little. Little by little, he stopped applying the wisdom that God had given to him. He started listening to the divisive voices of his wives and began to bow down to the foreign gods. And he didn't follow the Lord, his God, as his father David had. And so the Lord pronounced division upon him and his kingdom. Had Solomon owned his sin at that point? Had he turned from it? It would re be reasonable to assume that the division wouldn't have occurred. But because he refused to turn back to the Lord, because he continued on his path of destruction, not only would his life be destroyed, but the nation as well. The nation that had been united under his father was torn apart after his death. And so as we think about it, I think we can see that when we individually, when we as individual families, when we as a church, when we as a nation look to God, depend upon him, then there's a protection that is promised. But what does this look like? How does this accomplish well, the only protection that we have is to focus our eyes on Christ. When we find ourselves in trouble, I can almost always guarantee you that it's because you've taken your eyes off of your hope and focused on something else. When I look away from the Lord is when I get into trouble. When my eyes are focused on Him, my heart is guarded. And so then is my family, and so then is your church. 
as I thought about it, then there are three prescriptives that I might suggest to you in closing. The greatest thing that we can do is to walk humbly before our God. Now, you may say, that sounds great. I have that bumper sticker on my car, but what does that mean? How is that done? I think there's three things that we can learn here and apply. First, the first and most important is to seek the Lord. Now, again, this should be obvious, but I find that it many times is not lived out. Seek the Lord. How many decisions do we make that are big decisions that affect not only ourselves, but our families and generations to come? How many decisions that we make, as I tell people, I make a decision and I bring God along with me? That's a lot different than following after the Lord. Rather than taking his hand and following his lead. You see, the Lord desires to be involved in every decision that you make. Who you marry, what job you take, where you live, what major you're going to have in college, what school you should attend, and you can add to my list. Instead, though, many times I find that we live compartmentalized lives. Where there's a church compartment, and the real life compartment. And unfortunately, many times they don't mix well together. But James warns us this in James 1. He says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself and walk away and forget what it looks like. But if you look carefully into what? If you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, God will bless you for doing it. Hebrews 12, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Solomon also adds this in Proverbs 19, 20 and 21. Listen to, the advi- listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Seek Him out. Seek out the Lord. The second thing that we find that is noted for us in Hebrews 10 is don't neglect the fellowship. See, it's important for us to seek the Lord, but He's also given us the fellowship of believers to encourage us. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Let us consider how we may spur one another towards, on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Consider how you may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not just on Sundays, but every day. And if you live like this, I think we'll stay strong in the hope that is ours in Christ. Remembering and reminding one another of the hope that is secure in Him. The third thing that we find is to seek out wise counsel. Do not seek out counsel that will tell us what we want to hear, but to seek out those who are wise. Proverbs again tells us, Proverbs 15, 21 through 23. Foolishness brings joy to the one without sense. But a man with understanding walks a straight path. Plans fail when there is no counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. A man takes joy in giving an answer and a timely word. How good that is. This may be clear. When I tell you, you say, of course, that's true, but how many life decisions are we making without seeking counsel of others? And how many times are we apprehensive to ask somebody else because we're afraid they're going to disagree with what I want to do? Maybe we ask our friends, but unfortunately, as I said earlier, our friends too often are predisposed to tell us what we want to hear. To walk in wisdom. We would be wise to ask and receive counsel that comes from wisdom. 
seek the Lord. Don't neglect the fellowship and seek wise counsel. If we follow these prescriptives, I think we will protect our relationship in our family, in our homes, in our church, in our community. And we'll be able to withstand anything divisive that comes our way. Of course, this is on the assumption that we've already had that healing power in our relationship with God, that we have already come to Christ, that we have already confessed Him. This morning we're going to close by singing, we sang it last week, we're going to sing it again, uh, the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Let me just read the lyrics to that for you, because I think it has some insight, and I have an overhead here for you as well. O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant than free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Through death, life everlasting, he passed and we follow him there. Over us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Then turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and these things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's pray. Lord, I pray this morning that as we just consider your word, that we encourage one another, that we will talk to one another, that we will seek out wisdom, that we will listen to what your word has declared, and we'll long to align our life with what you have said. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the love that you have shown. May we speak the truth and love to one another, both today and evermore. Amen. Thank you.
Well, those who are visiting to, with us today, uh, if you haven't celebrated communion with us, communion, it, we do mean that word. It is a celebration. We come celebrating what Christ has done for us. We're encouraged to remember that, and that's where we take a moment to ask you to just silently pray, to consider what it means for Christ to have died for you, a sinner, for me, a sinner, and to give him thanks for that, to give him our praise for what he has done, the restored life that he has promised us. So we'd like to give you just a moment in silent prayer and meditation to consider what it is that he has done, and then we'll share the elements with you, and you're invited to come forward, but we'll give you those instructions in just a moment. Let's just spend a moment in silent prayer. Thank you for the gift of life that we remember and celebrate as we share in communion today. We give you thanks for the hope that is ours through your Son. And may we do this in remembrance of him. Amen. Well, our instructions that we follow are found in, in 1 Corinthians um, 11. And there we, we find these words. We find the, that first on the night that is betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and when he had broke it, he gave thanks, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so in, the, in that way, we take the bread, and we give him thanks as we break from the single body that has been broken for us. In the same way, after the supper, we're told that he takes the cup, and after he had given thanks for it, he says, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So as you are ready, you are invited to just come forward to take the bread and to take the cup. Um, and you can just take and eat here. You can go back to your seats if you'd rather do that. There are garbage cans on both sides here. So please, come, celebrate, eat, and drink with us today.
couple things to let you know about. I'm going to ask Deanna to come up first. Uh, come on up, Deanna. Um, Deanna is going on a trip with Navigators this summer, and um, she wants to let you know about that, ask for your prayers, but also she uh, could benefit from some financial support, so she has letters for you to pick up, but I'll let Deanna pick it up from there. Go ahead, Deanna. Like I said, she has some letters. She'll be in the back afterwards. Um, but this won't be your only chance to hear from Deanna. In two weeks, she's going to get baptized as well. So if Deanna would like to not to do that all by herself. So if any of you would like to be baptized, make sure you talk to me. Um, we'll be doing it up at, the, at First Dam. And, uh, so. But if you have questions, Deanna will be in the back by the information booth the Welcome Center um, and grab her after. Thanks, Deanna. Um, and a final reminder about the ladies' um, luncheon. Aaron, did you want to mention something real quick? I think information's in your bulletin about the dates and times and all that. Um, and the final thing, just a reminder, we have lunch afterwards, and you say, I didn't know, that's okay, we've still got food for you, so please stay if you can, um, and let's close with our final hymn, it'll be on the screen for you again today.
I thank you for having us be able to be here today to worship together. Lord, we know we can worship anywhere and we should worship anywhere, but there's a blessing in gathering with your people to worship you, to encourage and exhort one another. Thank you for allowing us to gather here today. We give you thanks. Amen. Go in God's peace. Thank you.